on the eve of his execution for murdering his wife, a condemned man tells his version of the story. He expresses little remorse, denies responsibility, and blames the murder on an extraordinary sequence of events. He claims that debilitated by alcoholism and driven by an uncontrollable urge, he killed his cat. An apparition of this cat then miraculously appeared on the bedroom wall, tormenting him further, and subsequently, a second cat, virtually identical to the first, magically appeared and came to live with him, driving him to frenzy. F Finally, in attempting to kill his second cat, he accidentally killed his wife. Obviously, the man is lying. This is what anyone in real life would say, and what we should say of the narrator of the black cat. Nor is he alone. In tale after tale, we find Poe's first-person narrators in similar situations, always with a dead body to account for, always the last to see the victim alive, and invariably offering an explanation that falls beyond the outermost limits of far-fetched. The hero of the assignation dies by poison. The narrator has spent all night drinking with him, alone in his palazzo. And he would have us believe it was suicide. In Lygia, the narrator's second wife wastes away from a mysterious illness. The narrator blames his first wife's ghost. Roderick Usher also dies in the sole company of the story's narrator, who claims that the dead man's emaciated, prematurely buried sister, after seven days of entombment, raised the screwed down lid of her coffin, opened a massive iron door, climbed to her brother's chamber, and <laughs> scared him to death. <laughs> the narrator of the telltale heart assures us he is not mad, then does everything he can to show us that he is. In fact, he is trying to cop an insanity defense. At the time Poe penned the story, murder trials in which seemingly sane people claimed insanity were the talk of the nation. What about the narrator who calls himself William Wilson? He claims that some imposter has been trying to supplant him. No, the narrator is the imposter. We can be certain because we know that the imposter is unable to speak above a whisper. And at the end of the tale, read closely and you'll discover that it is the narrator who whispers while his adversary speaks in a normal tone. How did we not see this before? 170 years we've been reading and rereading William Wilson. And we all missed the obvious. We were taken in because we expected and wanted the tale to be scary, not to make sense. Five of Poe's best known tales, all undoubted hoaxes. And these others, highly suspicious. This seems impossible, but it shouldn't. In fact, the evidence is everywhere that the idea we have of Poe and his work is a complete fiction. That usual picture of Poe as a pathologically brooding, tormented soul was concocted by a literary rival and is now thoroughly discredited. The true picture is of a hard-working writer, an astute magazine editor, the keenest critic of his generation, and a sought-after guest at the New York salons. Poe had demons, all right but real life ones, alcohol, poverty, and thwarted ambition. As for his fiction, on any accounting, it is dominated by humor, not terror. A dozen supposed tales of terror he wrote. These we call typical and keep republishing in edition after edition. But wait a second. If an author writes 69 stories and 12 of them are about death and madness, and these are the only ones that get read. Who's preoccupied with death and madness? The author or the readers? Poe was preoccupied, but not with madness and death, with hoaxing. This was by far the most consistent theme in his work. He expatiated on the subject, wrote tale after tale about hoaxes, and perpetrated on readers more hoaxes than anyone yet realizes. He wrote a disquisition on diddling, a 19th century synonym for scam. 
In it, he plumbed the niceties of swindles and described clever examples. More than a dozen of Poe's tales were about people perpetrating hoaxes, trickster tales. Like the one about the man with poor eyesight, who is too vain to wear glasses and gets tricked into marrying his own great-great-grandmother. Or the one where a man visits an insane asylum and at the end of a most unusual evening discovers that his hosts are actually the inmates who took over the asylum. Even more interesting are the many tales where the trick is being played on the reader. Like the front page article that ran in the New York Sun about a successful transatlantic balloon trip from Wales to South Carolina. The 5,000 word article was detailed, technical, not the least bit ironic, and of course, pure poppycock. Or the one, this is one of my favorites, in which a hypnotist presents in dry medical prose his notes on a case in which a dying patient is placed under hypnosis. The trance preternaturally extends his life, although the patient reports that he is in fact dead. Months pass until finally the man is taken out of hypnosis when he instantly liquefies. Utterly shameless. The best part is many readers actually believed it. Um, the United States Senate fell for another one. Uh, the Journal of Julius Rodman being an account of the first passage across the Rocky Mountains of North America ever achieved by civilized man. Poe learned early on how slow readers were to get his jokes. Learned, in fact, that he could actually tell readers that he was kidding and they still wouldn't believe him. The first tales he ever wrote the tales of the, were the tales of the Folio Club, and his satiric intentions he clearly stated. Though they were published individually, he had wanted to publish them together as the collected works of members of a literary club. The level of his seriousness you can gather from the names he gave to the putative authors. Yet many readers took them seriously, including John P. Kennedy, an estimable writer of the time and a patron of Poe. He urged Poe to tone down his bizarreries, which he said were being mistaken for satire. Poe replied, stating unequivocally that the tales were intended for half banter, half satire. One of these works is an over-the-top gothic tale of supernatural doings involving pictures in which things move and reincarnated horses, and at the end, a fiery death and smoke billowing up um, in the shape of a gigantic horse. This comic book version nicely captures the flavor, I think. Yet many readers took this seriously. So when Poe republished the tale a few years later, in order to make it clear that it was meant as a satire, he added a subtitle, a tale in imitation of the German. But readers still took it seriously. So then what he did in subsequent republications, he took off the subtitle. He did the same with another tale of the Folio Club, Siope, a fable in the manner of the psychological autobiographist. People took that one seriously too. So Poe subsequently removed the subtitle. At this early point, it seems to me, Poe takes a decisive turn in an unsettling direction, deliberately hiding his intentions. Writing is meant to communicate. Nonsense, says Poe. More often, it is meant to obfuscate. But here is something to me even more startling. Many leading Poe scholars, even knowing this history, knowing Poe's own words about his intent and the design of the Folio Club as a goof, nevertheless have insisted that the stories were in earnest. So here we see one big reason why, why people believe that Poe's work is dark and demonic when it's not. It's because readers do not want Poe to be a goof. They want him to be dark, tormented, romantic. Insist on it, really, because the truth is, we've always known there was something off about these tales. What would you call it? Excessive? Lame and cheesy? Silly? Three-fifths genius and two-fifths pure fudge, one of Poe's contemporaries famously called him, and the epithet has stuck ever since because it nails something we recognize in him. 
That hooey factor has led many readers to dismiss Poe. Here are a few choice comments. Incorrigible bad taste. Unsubtle. The intellect of a highly gifted young person before puberty. Ouch. Most readers just ignore Poe's excesses. Poe scholars, though, have developed a number of theories to account for it. As a deliberate choice Poe made to serve an artistic design. Actually, Poe left us two pieces that show us exactly what he was up to. One is mystification. This word meant more to Poe than merely puzzling someone. It meant duping them. The story tells of a student at Göttingen University, Baron Ritzner von Jung, brilliant, highly esteemed, but completely misunderstood. Anyone who was looking to find Poe, the person, in his fictional characters, forget about the tales of terror. This is the one. From his physiognomy to his outward demeanor, no person ever suspected him to be capable of a joke. To his true inner life, the Baron was one of those human anomalies now and then found who make the science of mystification the study and the business of their lives. Who make the science of mystification the study and the business of their lives. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the real Edgar Allan Poe. Now the hoax in this tale turns on a treatise that is not simply opaque, but actually a fraud. It is an amphigory, a species of language ingeniously framed so as to present to the ear all the outward signs of intelligibility and even of profundity, while in fact, not a shadow of meaning existed. In this particular amphigory, there is a key. If the, re if the reader omits words according to a specified pattern, von Jung explains, an intelligible story appears. In this case, a tale of a duel between two baboons. The description of the fake treatise strikingly fits Poe's supposed tales of terror. For in these works, we find all manner of nonsense. In a fundamentally ludicrous tale, all of it veiling another tale, a completely intelligible, rationally solvable murder mystery hiding like the purloin letter in plain sight, but utterly unperceived even by expert readers. The other, gu the other guide to Poe's method is how to write a Blackwood article, an article that sends up what was then the most successful literary magazine in the English-speaking world. The story features one Suki Snobs, corresponding secretary for a Philadelphia literary society who was anxious to elevate the society's writing. She travels to Scotland to seek advice from Blackwood, who enthusiastically shares his recipe um, for constructing tales full of taste, terror, sentiment, metaphysics, and erudition. Gee, who does that sound like? This article is laugh out loud funny today because of how perfectly Blackwood's precepts match Poe's own style in the tales of terror. Pay minute attention to the sensations. Hint everything, assert nothing. Have an air of erudition. Put in something about the supernal oneness. What's fascinating is to see how Poe deployed these stratagems, specifically to conceal his hidden murder mysteries and reveal them. The sensationalism, the things suggested but not stated, the supernatural mumbo jumbo, these draw our attention away from the mundane matters of fact, but cast a cold eye on them and these evasions, evasions turn into clues. Revealing the fault lines in its tale, the narrator would like you to believe. The contradictions, the hedges, the belabored dubious explanations, and the weasel wording. The I thinks and I don't remembers and it must have been and even you're not going to believe this, but follow up these clues and the hidden story emerges with breathtaking clarity. The process is delightful and astonishing. We've read clever mysteries before, but nothing, nothing like these. The discovery, while enthralling and fun, is also deeply disturbing. Before, we had dementia. Now we have a greater horror, someone faking dementia 
and getting away with murder. In the darkest tragedy, there is uplift. The character gains vision and the audience compassion. A tragedy brings us together. Now, truth itself is victim, and literature is but a mask. The author is a charlatan and worse, a false friend, an assassin, a serial killer. He is a master diddler who knows how readers can be taken in, spins his tale for reasons of his own, and keeps them to himself. Your true diddler winds up all with a grin, Poe tells us, but this nobody sees but himself. When his allotted labors are accomplished, Poe writes, he goes home, he locks the door, he divests himself of his clothes, he puts out the ca his candle, he gets into bed, he places his head upon the pillow, all this done, and your diddler grins. Thank you. <laughs>